start? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Akash, and uh, I'm the guy standing between you and your lunch. Uh, so I'm, I'm well aware of that, so I'm going to try to you know, go through this faster and make sure that this is worth your wait. Uh, I, I work at Gojek. I head products at Gojek. Uh, how many of you know what Gojek is? I do. Oh, that's a lot more than I thought. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, actually, no, outside of that context. <laughs> you have come across before that. Okay. Uh, another thing is, okay, let me actually get to what Gojek is. Okay. Uh, I'll try to keep it very short. Uh, quite difficult, though. Uh, primarily because very few of will you actually know what it is and the talk needs to be in that context. So we have uh, nine distinct products, uh, although all of them are in the same app. I know most of the uh, UI, UX, mobile people will already cringe with the thought of that. Uh, we have basically Swiggy, Ola, Book My Show, Urban Clap, Growfers, Paytm, 1MG, and few uh, as being lazy, not yet born in India. Uh, that's the NYB part. Uh, all of these into the same application. Okay. And uh, in most of these, we are already the market leaders in that segment, which means there is a lot of scale happening over there, which comes with problems. We have about 250,000 drivers. Uh, we do about 12 completed orders per second, which is not interesting enough. Yeah, we, we wanted to come up with a little fun metric to figure out, you know, the scope in general. Uh, if I'm not wrong, currently we are on 25, but the last calculated one was about 22 round trips per, to moon per month. That's the distance our drivers travel. Okay. Uh, now, all of this is still fine. Uh, we basically launched in Jan 2015. So this is roughly 20 months to do Sorry. Yeah, all of this. Uh, now, this comes at a really heavy price. This is massive chaos. This is not beautifully done. This is, you know, worlds of problems in that. Uh, so, what I really wanted to share uh, when Zenab called me that, you know, like, hey, can we do something from Gojek? Gojek is anyway sponsoring this. You know, if you can just share your experience. Uh, the difficult thing to pick was uh, what is it that we talk about primarily because Meta Refresh is such a varied audience, right? Uh, but as we were introducing the product stream for the first time, uh, I thought, let's just talk about that, right? Uh, and obviously, if it was about design, then I wouldn't be here. Uh, so to get that context, how many are product managers, are people who are running their own startups, are, are uh, involved in making decisions on a day-to-day -day or a weekly basis about where the product is going to go? How many product guys? Okay, that's eight or nine. Okay. Uh, I hope everyone else as well finds this interesting. Uh, happy to talk about anything else as well outside. But let me get started. Uh, okay. So, uh, even on the product side itself, uh, the learnings that I want to talk about is not about how to get a product market fit. I don't know about that. Uh, how to really grow fast, it's completely market dependent. Uh, so the only thing that I can actually share over here is uh, what is it that we did which actually slowed down our progress, right? So once you hit a product market fit, like any, any startup, any product, uh, goes through two phases before product market fit and after product market fit and there is a world of difference between these two uh, What really happens after you have hit the product market fit is the only reason you are not growing is because of your company That's literally what it translates into. So what is it that you can do to make sure that once you hit that milestone uh, Whatever decisions you have taken in the past or how you're going to go ahead in the future does not slow down your progress uh, that's what I wanted to focus on. Uh, very simple learnings in this case where uh, build for future versus releasing fast, 
I'm just giving you an overview. We'll get into the details of each of these. Uh, proactive product refactoring, uh, build versus buy, and your internal customers are important too. Uh, how many are engineers over here or come from software background? Oh, so refactoring is not an alien word. Uh, OK, uh, another background over here. Uh, in product management, there are no real black and white calls. Or rather, there are very few such decisions which are black and white decisions. Uh, most of the guys who got hired into startups as product managers, uh, the way I got as well, uh, weren't there when the company started, right? Or even when the company started, there was no product manager role. Either you were a developer, or you were a designer, or you were a sales guy, or someone like that. And all of these people come together and decide how the product is running gonna run, right? How it is going to be designed. Uh, where you need to have a product manager is when you want to have a considered judicious calls about how do we do this? There is no clear solution. And that's when you really hire a product manager, which means that everything we talk about over here, there are no clear cut guidelines. There can never be. Uh, it's just things to think about. Uh, let's start with this. Building for future versus releasing fast. Now, this seems like a very trivial topic that obviously you want to you know, build for future and make sure that you're not going to do any rework and stuff. Uh, but when the pressure starts building that, hey, your competitor has launched something, you need to release something. Uh, there is another issue and there is a payment gateway that you need to fix and then you release something. Over there, you are constantly trying to release as fast as possible. And that has to be the goal for your company. Uh, the other extreme on that, though, is that you want to release for everything. You want to build a feature for everything that can potentially happen, which obviously is impossible, but a lot of people try to achieve that. Unfortunately, I did as well. Uh, so let's look at the spectrum, right? Uh, we have just enough for now, which is literally what I know today. I'm going to build that, release it out. It can happen really fast. Other uh, is what I talk about, a ludicrous one. Uh, I see three gaps, uh, three points in between. One is just keeping it flexible. Uh, what it means is uh, very simple, simple practices, like if you are defining a mobile application. <clears throat> By the way, Gojek is, is a mobile-only application, so a lot of what I'm saying would come from that perspective. Uh, when you're designing a mobile application, please don't keep any logic you know, on the front end. Seems 101, but has bitten me back badly. Uh, don't keep your assets, your text, everything. Don't keep it hard-coded. Either take it from configuration, take it from the back end, wherever you want to take it from, uh, but don't hard-code it. Like for simple changes to your application, you will have to have another release. And uh, obviously on Android, the adoption rates are really bad, which means that 90% of your uh, consumer base is not going to get what you're releasing now. Although they could have if you had just taken two minutes to think about how to package the whole thing. Uh, this is very easy to do, and as a product manager, this is something you should be doing all the time, right? L look at what the product is, like what the feature is. Think of all possible branches in which this can grow. I'm not even talking about roadmap. Roadmap is linear, right? This is like a complex tree. Uh, it can go in any direction. Just keep it flexible. No extra development effort, just half an hour of more thinking. Then you want to keep it configurable, which I was talking about as taking things from remote config, having your variables being configurable, that will really allow you to play around with your product without troubling your designers or developers. Uh, the last one is uh, pluggable, uh, which takes a little more development effort, actually. Uh, but depending on what you're releasing, this can be incredibly useful. For example, if you're launching one payment uh, gateway integration, if you can design it in a way where you add another payment gateway and it starts working, beautiful. Right. Uh, yes, but that takes a little more development effort. There is really no excuse for any person not to at least get at, to at least this level. The configurable part. Uh, just let's take an example. I mentioned it already. Uh, when you are accepting payment, uh, accepting payment. This is basically online payment. Initially, when Gojek started, we used to take only cash. Then we added GoPay, which is yet another uh, way of uh, paying for it. Now, are you going to add more payment methods there? Uh, do you want to block any of these based on some metrics? Maybe there was a you know, vulnerability on a particular version. There was an issue with some integration. 
there was a problem with a particular service. Uh, how do you provide or show discount in many ways? Obviously, whenever you are promoting something like Gopi, which was our own product, you want to give discount. Now, when we began giving discounts, we were giving it on only one way. That is like a percentage discount with some text over there. Uh, the first cut that I got of the product was uh, hard-coded discount text. Like, dude, what happens when I move from 25% to 30%, right? And that's a basic one, but it just goes on and on and on. So you really want to make sure that you are thinking about how this product can potentially evolve. Make sure it is flexible enough that it can take your imagination and run with it for a long time. Uh, so the key goal, I believe, is just this. Make sure what you're pushing out is the most flexible system for the lowest possible cost. That's where the judgment comes in. So it's your call where you draw the line. Uh, but now, how do you do that? Uh, most important is, unless you yourself come from a tech background and know exactly how all parts of your systems work, you will never be able to decide uh, how exactly it can be achieved. It's going to be your tech team who will be able to tell you, or your designers will be able to tell you how we can actually do this, which means whatever branches that you're talking about, what you're thinking about, please communicate it clearly to each of your team members and ask them, if you want to do this, is it possible for me to get to the state without doing much development just by configuring things, just by pushing things, you know, having some toggles in place? Uh, it's really them who are going to do this. You are just an enabler in that case. Uh, things like web views, uh, I don't know what the UX standards on that are. Uh, we should talk about it later on. Uh, but for certain pages, so we have a way of topping up your GoPay account, right? Uh, now, I would, and we went ahead with web views over there rather than, uh, uh, rather than a native implementation because we will keep adding more and more bank supports over there, right? So that was far easier for us to do, and then I don't have to worry about making another app release or something. So the load on a product manager goes down massively once you start following these practices. Uh, this is an interesting one, actually. So things go wrong all the time. Now, when we talk about configurability or when we talk about uh, being prepared for the future, we are generally thinking about the positive scenarios. Uh, quite frequently, neg negative scenarios come into play, and you need to be ready for those as well. Uh, for example, let's assume that we launch some sort of a payment gateway or a top-up mechanism, and uh, that has an integration with a bank. And once you launch and once things start scaling, uh, the bank gateways goes down because they can't take the load that you are really pushing at them. Uh, what are you going to do? Are you just going to keep things out there and let every customer feel that, hey, whenever I do something, it crashes? Because customer doesn't understand why things are crashing. For them, it's your product which is crashing. For them, it's your service that is not really working. So you need to be, uh, you need to also think about the contingency scenarios and have a plan for how you're going to roll back or how you're going to communicate with the users when things go wrong. Uh, you will have security vulnerabilities in a certain API versions. So for example, you are using V2 and V3 for you know, like booking a ride. Uh, you are on V7 at this point, let's assume. And you realize that on V2, there was a security vulnerability that you need to address and that's leaking some very critical data. Uh, what are you going to do? Like, it's a mobile application. It's out there. I want to just shut down the whole thing. Are you going to shut down those APIs? And uh, how are you going to communicate to those users? They're not going to read news, or they're not going to read the push notifications that you're sending to them. Their application just stops working. So you need to have a way of uh, force upgrading those people or giving just that user base warning that, hey, please upgrade. You know, like, come to this version. There is a problem in this version have a very seamless way of moving from whatever the current state is to the future state. Now, I'm just giving examples. Now, in your products, things can be different. In your products, the way things fail will be very, very different. But please go through all the negative scenarios as well. And if there is an easy way of addressing those, uh, please invest in those.
because this is where you will spend a massive amount of your time, right? Like when you are working, like when you have actually hit that hockey stick, you don't want to be bothered by these things. You don't want to be bothered by all the problems that are coming in and they are going to come in purely because of the scale that you are hitting, purely because of the PR focus you have on your startup at that point. Oh, we, we had an interesting one actually in this. Uh, so we launched a GoCar uh, application. Uh, by the way, Gojek is, as you would have learned outside on the booths, uh, we primarily do two-wheeler uh, transportation, be it courier, be it food, be it groceries or people. Uh, that's where most majority of our drivers are. Uh, but we wanted to launch four-wheeler transportation as well. Now, when... We were ready with the app. We had submitted the app to the app store, uh, hadn't published it. Uh, our backend systems were not ready. We were still waiting for testing few things. It was about two days uh, before we wanted to launch. And uh, somehow by mistake, uh, the app actually gets published. Right. So nobody's ready. The PR statements have not gone out. People think it's some sort of a secret launch that has actually happened where we just weren't ready. And because of some complexities about the app store policies and stuff, we could not roll it back because rolling back itself would have taken us around four hours for some reason. The whole company was working on it. It was not possible. So we had to take a call as to, hey, are we just going to go live? And we finally went live, just last minute, shuffled through everything, made things happen, and we went live. But after that day, Whenever we launch something new, we basically have a toggle to kill things. So whenever we launch a new product, everything is switched off from the back end. I will launch it. Once I know everything is stable, then I'll enable it. So we learned it's, it's not that, you know, I had planned for this, but even this kind of thing can happen at any scale in your company. It's not that just because it's a big company, everything goes goody goody, quite the opposite, I would say, actually. Uh, so be ready for absolutely anything happening. Uh, because everybody's evaluating you at that point. Uh, build versus buy seems like a very boring topic, actually. Uh, you're just basically figuring out if I'm going to use a marketing solution from outside, or I'm going to, uh, or I'm going to build it in-house. Uh, but as a product manager, this is where you'll decide whether you're going to spend two months building your own product or building something else. If you are going to buy uh, from outside, you will have to continue supporting it for next one year, two years. You're going to have data blockages over there. So this is probably one of the most critical choices you will be making uh, as a product owner, uh, as, as a product manager for the team. Uh, the considerations that you want to have when you are doing something like this is, as like specifically in the earlier days when things are not sorted out, uh, I would personally inclined towards the buy decision rather than the build decision. Uh, as you start maturing and you even understand what does it really mean for me to actually have an advertising platform or a recommendation engine or anything else that you're building, uh, only then think of building it yourself. Because many a times what you perceive it as the system that you're building and what it ends up being can be completely different. Right. So especially if you come from engineering background or your engineering team is very aggressive in general, uh, you would end up making the build decisions, uh, which, which may not be the right thing to do uh, in this case. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so let's take a scenario of uh, you actually hitting the hockey stick. In an ideal case scenario, what you want to spend your 50% of the time on is uh, to actually maintain the current system, support things, take care of bugs, and you want to spend 50% of your time on building new features, acquiring new markets, you know, uh, experimenting with new systems. What would happen in a general case scenario is you will spend close to 100% of your time just firefighting because you hadn't really designed the original systems to hit the scale that you that you had actually hit, uh, which means you are you are really really uh, you are really short on development bandwidth or management bandwidth in general. 
Uh, in the worst case scenario, if it's really taking off, uh, then it's just going to be horrible. Like you won't even have enough time to take care of all the things that are going wrong. Now, which is, this is all normal, right? And there is really little that you can do about it. The interesting part over here is, at the same time, you have internal stakeholders in the company, your finance team, which has some finance portal and some basic accounting parts that are there. You have your customer support team, uh, which is doing your daily customer support, you know, like taking Zendesk tickets and answering those uh, customers or drivers, refunding the tickets, figuring out where the lost items are. There is a business which is running as usual. Now, when all of this is happening, how much time do you think you're going to spend with them to fix their problem? Uh, the intuitive answer is just no, right? You don't do that. Uh, that, yes, makes sense in the short run because you want to put out some fires. But as you start putting out those fires and you scale up, uh, things can get really ugly, really bad, and the whole system can stall because you did not support these uh, auxiliary functions. So as a product manager, yes, all of this is happening. It is important. Uh, please pay attention to your internal customers. <clears throat> Who are these internal customers? Uh, generally, these customers are your ops teams, customer care, finance and accounting, recruiting. Like, if there is one thing that you're allowed to get distracted by, uh, it's recruitment. That is really what's going to make or break your company or your product. Uh, marketing as well. Uh, let's take an example of uh, customer care, actually. Uh, I think it's very common everywhere. So. You are at a level X, right? When you build your customer support team of, say, 20 people. Uh, you got a Zendesk license. You are talking to your customers. You are paying a lot of attention to how the customer care team is uh, set up, what kind of data that ha they have access to, how they're talking to the customers. And then overnight, you go from X to 1000 X. Right. Like you had set up some systems for these 20 people to work. Obviously, you have not done every possible automation needed because you had no idea that it will be needed. What happens to these 20 people? They will still scramble around. They will get some guy, like they will start prioritizing. They will start prioritizing tickets about, oh, this ticket is more important than the other one. All of this will happen. They will hire like maybe 20 more people or 30 more people. Uh, you can't hire like 200 people. Uh, and start dealing with the problem. But that 1,000 is going to very quickly go to 10,000 and 1 lakh and 2 lakh. Uh, if during the 100 to 1,000, obviously it was not easy on you or on the infrastructure on the dev team, right? If you're not paying attention to the customer support team at that point, when you go beyond, say, 1,000 or when you go beyond 10,000, what's going to happen is your app ratings will start crashing down because people are not now worried about the app rating. They're actually saying that, hey, your service is so bad that I'm not able to get any answers, so I'm going to downgrade your app. Once that starts happening, you will have your PR issues. Your competitor will actually jump on to that. Pretty much your whole system can stall because you did not pay attention to this. The same goes for finance. Like You will be getting into next fund, uh, fundraising rounds. You need to make sure that you're managing your finances well and your cash flows well. Please pay attention to this, however bad other things are. Right? It's very easy to ignore it, and this is really what can take you down even after you have found a product market fit. That happens so many times with so many companies. Right? It, it's, it's not even funny, actually, how bad this can get. Uh, OK. This is where I'll take a little more time. Uh, Refactoring is, so I, I come from engineering background, which is probably why I, this came very naturally to me. Uh, it's just taking a system and breaking it down into the correct abstractions and making sure that those correct abstractions are working fine. Right? Uh, it's very simple. And we do that intuitively all the time. Uh, when you start any product, you will see that, hey, my mobile application is one product, and there is a product manager for it. You are the whole backend system or the overall product is like one product. There is a product manager for that. And then you will pull out uh, maybe a user communications system, right, which takes care of your push notifications, emails, everything. You will put up a product manager for that. It's something that every one of you, irrespective of which background you come from, will do naturally because that's just logical. Uh, the key learning there, though, is uh, before product market, we have one product manager, if at all, actually. Uh, after about two years of struggle, 
you will have like a very complex system like this, right? You have like unknown number of internal products and you basically have a travel location service, customer owner, order management system, uh, notifications engine, driver rating service. All of these will become your very detailed small, small products and that's how every company operates, right? Like even within a notification engine, if you go to a very large company, like say Facebook, uh, I'm sure they'll probably have like a 20 people, like 20 product managers over there looking at each nuance over there. Uh, now, what I wish I had done differently is you're gonna get there one way or another, right? It's, it's like having a kid, like either you can ask the kid to walk from point A to point B or you kind of drag it kicking and screaming. What happens with most of the companies, you get dragged kicking and screaming to get there, which means it's inefficient. So what is really important is once you know that you are hitting a product market fit, please be proactive in building up the structure. Like start proactively splitting out your products, delegating it to other people, make sure that they're working on their own. Uh, now, in a very larger context, it's very easy to imagine what a product is, right? But once you start splitting down into these levels, what do you even mean by product? So I have a few examples on this. Uh, generally, when you're when you're talking to your uh, tech team uh, and assuming they are following what is the current latest and greatest in the trends in general, uh, you will start hearing words like uh, microservices or service-oriented architecture or like asynchronous systems. Uh, these are services, right? Uh, which means that, let's take an example of a driver location service, like which is what you know Uber would need or what we need is at any given point of time, I need to know what is the location of the driver. It's very simple. So your engineer will recommend you that, hey, let's just build a separate system that will scale on its own, uh, that is going to uh, have a different tech stack, it will have its own different database, it will have its own load balancers, all of that is correct. He's absolutely not wrong anywhere, by the way. I'm not really talking about uh, this versus that. Um, but as a product manager, what do you think about that service is where is it going to be used? Uh, it will be used to show the drivers on the map, right? Let's just take an example of Uber. You basically see various cars on the map, how they're moving, that is one use case. Then you will uh, need that same service to tell you which is the nearest driver from your location where you're actually making the booking. Uh, you will need the same service when a driver is going from whatever location is at to your location when you are waiting for him to pick you up, right? Uh, there will be fraud. <coughs> Sorry, uh, there will be uh, fraud prevention systems or fraud detection systems which will need the driver location as, it is, as he's trajecting uh, to know if he's really fooling the customer or maybe he's just trying to simulate that he's over there. L a lot of things happen, we can get into fraud later. Uh, but that is, that is what, as a product manager, you look at. So now, <clears throat> if you have a dedicated product manager to look at that as a service, rather than just pulling it, sorry, uh, look at that as a product, rather than just looking at it as a service, what's gonna happen is you will start thinking about how to optimize that part, right? Uh, so the examples, in case of a driver location service, it's just like a backend code base which sits with a database and some server, right? But once you start looking at it as a product, it is everything, which means it's the SDK that you're installing it on the driver app, it's the SDK that we are potentially installing it on the consumer app or on the giving it to other services. It's the logic that you have or the rules that you have to capture these locations, which means you will start thinking about how do I make sure that I get the most accurate location without draining my driver's battery? Uh, how do I make sure that without putting too much load on the system, I try to find as much accurate location as possible at different states, like the frequency at which driver needs to update the location when he's stationary is different than the frequency at which he needs to update if he's moving. And start getting into all of these nitty gritties. Uh, have rules around if he moves from point A to point B at like 200 kilometers per hour, right? Obviously he's faking it. So is something else happening? Flag that driver location. Figure out what other, like, you know, if there are other markers which tell you that there is some fishy behavior happening over there. 
but all of this you will do only if there is a dedicated product manager looking at that one piece now you will get there once your uh, driver fraud rates go through the roof let's say right you will think about it but the cost that you're paying during those three months or four months where you learn that I need to do this and I have losses and my customers have had bad experience that is really the cost that you're uh, that you're paying for this if you do it reactively so the learning in this case is let's try to pull out all of these smaller smaller internal products have dedicated product managers not just engineering teams have a dedicated product manager for those as early as possible and obviously this makes sense only if you know that you're hitting that hockey stick and things are going to get chaotic really fast uh, in the earlier phases it's completely useless uh, same goes for user communication service uh, I'll just quickly cover this uh, standard right you are sending push notifications you are sending emails you are sending snail mails in actually certain financial uh, for certain financial companies um, you are making calls all of this data is there yes you can have a very simple stupid code base which takes care of this but is there anybody who is looking at that hey this particular person responds to reminders on push notifications better versus the other person re uh, responds to reminders on emails better right uh, this certain segment of people actually respond to better on emails from morning 8 to 10 whereas some other set of people respond better between evening 5 to 9 so is there someone who is dedicatedly thinking about it if not you will start thinking about it when your conversions really go down but if you are able if you are able to create these product teams upfront you will not feel the pain you just start seeing benefits from day one so i think as a product manager specifically for a company which is making that transition uh, if you go down this path uh, your overall friction over a period of next six to eight months will be very very low uh, okay I think I really moved fast <laughs> I still have almost 10 minutes uh, any questions hi, hi. Uh, great talk thanks I just want to ask that uh, when you say that you divide your teams into smaller chunks of teams okay so how do you manage the friction between those teams like there may be a part like for example the customer care you said so say the order management team or something decided to give them some feature and which the customer care is not able to perform well so how do you manage this kind of uh, like friction between these teams or between the product managers as you say so one is uh, it's not really one team giving feature or giving something to another team uh, it always has to be a product manager who is looking at one aspect of your business and then talking to other aspects saying that hey we need to change certain things now the conflict over there happens like if there is a conflict fundamentally we are looking at uh, wrong optimizations that's how I would actually put it uh, yes there will be certain things which are difficult for a particular team to do but as long as both of them collectively are looking at global optima saying that hey how do i make my end customers life better how do i increase my throughput over there how do i reduce my uh, drop rate that is there how do i increase my app rating on the play store uh, the conflict over there should not be there in an ideological sense uh, it will be there in terms of resource allocation yes like do I have enough people developers or QAs to work on something and release it and that always exists all the time over there uh, the way to take care of that is deprioritize something else right uh, and that's a tough call and which is why I'll just go back to the previous slide saying that everything is a judgment at the end of the day and whoever is a product manager over there has to take the judgment call saying that what do I think is the best for the company as a whole not for my product not for my team for the end customer what is better hi yeah. uh, i have a question sorry yeah uh, on your let's say yes <laughs> sorry 
Uh, nice talk, by the way. Like very good uh, insights into so on. So I had one question about one of your sli slides where you mentioned that uh, uh, do not put much logic in the uh, front end side. Yes. And there are basically two school of uh, thoughts here, right? Like one yes. is about the traditional applications with everything on the back end side, and the new thought is about the single page applications where you provide a much better use by having a lot of your, let's say, uh, half of your logic or validations on the uh, UI side. Yes. So uh, for a uh, product which is, uh, you know, uh, struggling to jump into the market, like who are like struggling to release it as soon as possible, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, these two options? Like which one has a weightage over what? So one is, uh, is it really difficult to put that, uh, okay, let, let me actually caveat my statement, right? Uh, it's not possible to have the front end as a pure dumb, you know, view layer. Obviously that's not possible and that's, like you will end up creating a, a monstrously ineffective product if you really go down that path. Uh, while saying that, uh, is it really difficult all the time to push that logic to in, in the background or have that decision or assets coming from the back end? Uh, have it cached if you want, right? Uh, have it like cache updated every uh, one day or something or one or one month is kind of impractical, but one day. Uh, if you think that, hey, no, I need to really read it from the uh, file system to have a certain transition in a you know with certain efficiency or whatever ux guidelines that i have uh, do it that way uh, if, if that is uh, required uh, if it is really about validations uh, see if the validations themselves can be pushed to the back end where i actually make a call and get certain data from there. if it is absolutely not possible then yes now coming to the last part of your question is to depending on which state the product is in, do I, if I want to really push it out to the market, then should I do this or you know, like not really worry about optimization because I don't know if I need that much flexibility or not. Uh, that's a judgment call. I can't really take that call for anyone. Uh, in my experience, it has been relatively easy to have a lot of these things done uh, within Gojek. Like Gojek is un unfortunately, fortunately, the only mobile app that I have worked on. I come from a I have primarily worked on web apps before that. Uh, so all of my context, knowledge, problems, everything is heavily influenced by my exposure over here. I'm sure there are use cases where you can't really put this logic on the front end or sorry, on the back end. Uh, then yes, you don't really have an option. Uh, but yeah, try, please try to move as uh, far away from pos uh, as possible from hard coding anything that you can't change later on if you want to. Hi. Um, sorry. Yeah. So you started this product in 2015. That's correct, right? Uh, we launched the app in 2015. Yes. Okay. It, it was actually like a, it was a call center based company, the way Meru started in India mm -hmm. for almost four years, but with very low number of uh, drivers. It's like in 2015, when we launched the app, if I'm not wrong, we had either 200 or 800. I'm not sure. I think 200. Uh, uh, so your app is hybrid or native? Uh, it's a combination. So there is no one, like, yes, it's a single application in Play Store, but as you can see, there are 11 services already. A uh, few of those services are hybrid, few of those are native, but I would say almost 80% is native. So how do you take this decision when you have to go to native and when you have to go hybrid? I mean, we always keep having discussion that which component we want to go hybrid or which one we want to go native. So that's a very, I know it's a de debatable topic, but uh, if you can give your insights that when do you decide to go native and when you decide to go hybrid? Oh, I absolutely happy to. Uh, the considerations for me over there, okay, and take it with a pinch of salt because I, this is heavily biased from a uh, business side, uh, which means I need tech and design to push back on me where I'm not making sense. So this is those, you know, like this is just my take. Uh, it's a function of uh, how awesome an experience that I need for my current market versus the cost I'm paying by losing efficiency, by increasing the app size, by potentially adding more chaos to the overall code base. Uh, so similar to the scale that we had around when to build, I would just see the same scale and have my gut feeling around that, hey, if if it is going to give me, let's say, like 0.5% of my business, I don't want to add two more MB to my application and you know increase the threshold at which users download my application. Uh, 
uh, or potentially have bugs which are going to crash my system or potentially have security vulnerabilities over there. Uh, so I would rather not have that. Uh, at the same time, it's a function of what kind of application is it? Like, am I just submitting some form to get a uh, to get some service? For example, we have GoClean uh, where you act, where you uh, order for a cleaner at home immediately, right? It's just submitting form. There are no complex interactions over there. Whereas if it is food, I want people to browse through like a lot of restaurants over there and go through menus, select something. Uh, so for GoClean, I'm actually more than happy to have uh, net, just like non-native implementation, hybrid implementation, or even just pure web view, to be honest. Uh, whereas for GoFood, I do not want that, right? Uh, because you don't want to launch something where people don't take it up because it's bad, because the user experience is not good. So it's really some sort of a middle ground between all of these, plus my UX and developers' inputs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've had similar learnings from Razorpay. Uh, my question is more towards uh, prioritization. So most startups tend to work in a crunch mode, right? You, as a product manager, you never think that you have enough tech bandwidth to do all the things that you want to do, right? Yeah, what if, fact. let's say, there's a scenario where you can either uh, refine a particular feature and make it 10% better, 15% better. Maybe the experience becomes better for your users, but it still works. It's not a broken feature. Versus sure. making something new. You have to prioritize bandwidth between these two things. How do you go about that, Gozek? Okay, so I had to struggle a little to come up with a formula for that because with 11 products, we run into that all the time, basically. Uh, so the formula for that, the way I look at either features or any of these end results is I personally start from my market, then from there to customer segments, assigning what is the weightage for these customer segments and for which of this customer segment, what is the importance of this feature? And then have an estimate about, and again, we can come to what that means to even have an estimate, right? I just don't want to pull a number out of thin air, but have an estimate for what is the impact of improving it by 10%, and even that 10% is such a subjective part, versus adding something new which you haven't tested, whereas we know what that the current uh, drop-off rates look like. Let's assume that I know for a fact that my search while looking for location search, uh, whenever my location search is takes, say, two seconds to load, there is a X drop-off. It goes to three seconds. There is a X plus Y drop-off. I know that for a fact, right? So over there, if I do something which is going to pull down for, let's assume, for lower end Android devices, that always happens. I want to shave off that Y and get to X. I pretty much know exactly how much market share I'm going to gain, right? And that certainty also actually comes into picture over there. For uh, new features that I'm going to add, we'll need to figure out how we are going to even estimate the growth that we're going to see because of those. So. I would actually say that have like a 10 or 20% budget for such experiments, which is going to help you make the larger decisions of prioritization. So it really boils down to having a separate bandwidth for uh, experiments, which are going to give you inputs in your prioritization, which will really drive 80%. Right. And again, that 80, 20 is like a random number, but what works for you depends on how mature your product is or how mature the ecosystem is. Right. Like I'm not going to reinvent Uber. To be honest, I've spent like five years perfecting it, right? So the amount of experimentation that I need to conduct over there is lower, whereas something like uh, uh, GoFood, uh, because in Indonesian market, it's a very new product, they don't even have a culture of food delivery. Like the restaurants over there never used to deliver. So the, for people over there, it's a very new market. So over there, my experimentation budget would be higher because I don't even know which direction the product is going to go to. Just so, as a follow-up to that question, I mean, you still said that there is, um, you know, you can say in, you sort of have some numbers around, like, you know, there's a drop in so many customers. But what if it is like an engineering backlog, you know, that th there's just something that it's become very messy and it has to be refactored, but very often the product manager will be like, no, we do not have the bandwidth. We have to push out these features. So uh, how do you sort of... You know, do you actually From take it up? From whose perspective <laughs> are you asking that question? Because <laughs> I'd rather not say. <laughs> like this is this is a call for the product manager, right? So the, I think the real question is for a product manager when engineering says that, hey, dude, this is unmanageable now, right? Uh, how do I say that? Like, dude, just push for another two days, you know, or like two weeks, and let's just get this out. Uh, you, the way basically I was trying to like the reason it took me a while to 
get to the formula that you know for the question that you asked i think the same formula we can apply over here as well at the end of the day the reason that conflict exists is there is no metric based on which you can take the decision so as long as we are able to provide that metric saying that hey any time i touch this and i'm giving a very textbook answer over there there is a spectrum but uh, if there is a particular module all the stories that we run over here go uh, you know like take like 20% more time <clears throat> than expected then i can make a case saying that hey like look at this like this is always taking more time let me give me two days i'll clean this up and after that we won't have bugs we won't like we'll move faster in this direction and you need to have a common metrics around which you can have conversation otherwise it's just subjective right it doesn't go anywhere so you earlier talked about breaking down your product into smaller products or services yes. How yes. do you go about making that decision that this now needs to be a separate thing? What are, can be some okay. pointers to help making that decision? Uh, yes. That gets too theoretical actually, which is I've skipped it altogether from here. Uh, okay. So when I look at uh, GoRide as a product, right, or let's take Uber actually as a product. Uh, in Uber, what all actions or end goals you are trying to achieve uh, if i ask you to describe how you use uber you will basically say that hey, i log into uber i look for vehicles uh, i select a certain vehicle type then i make i make a payment or making then i'm waiting for that guy to come up then he picks me up and then he completes the trip i can give feedback right this is the end thing that you see uh, when someone describes an existing product in this way what you're really doing is saying, my uh, looking for a driver does not care how payments are being made, right? My login does not care about how a driver is being found or how a driver is being tracked or is being displayed. So once you start finding all of these orthogonal systems, uh, all of these actually are products in their own measure uh, because they have business complexity, they need to have their own dev team, they need to have their own vision, they need to improve their efficiency without affecting any other part of the system. But now if I really follow this, it can go to nth level, I'll have, where I'll have probably like 10,000 products in my company, right? Like including validations. So for example, my login does not really care about how validation is done. I'm not gonna really create another product for validation, right? So where do you draw the line? So the line for me is, uh, let's assume that you start with like five product managers in your company. You basically see all of these systems, group together all the systems which are as similar as possible to each other and call them one product. That's really what we do intuitively anyway. I'm just putting a structure to that. Once a certain part either starts getting very complex, that someone needs to constantly think about that, right? Uh, again, going back to why I say that you need to do this proactively, is once it starts becoming more complex, very likely you're already late, which means your business is paying price for it. That product is well integrated, like not badly uh, coupled with other parts of the system, which means pulling it out is going to be very difficult. Like the boat has already left in some way, right? Uh, but that is 99% of the cases. Uh, but once you start seeing either things which are getting complex, uh, the module, the team that actually handles the module, it is getting requests from multiple sources. Sales comes and tells them something. You are uh, maybe even within our application, for example, uh, GoRide will tell them something, GoFood will tell them something, and they are getting requests from different, different uh, peripheral systems. Very likely that has an existence of its own, right? That's another indicator that, hey, this needs to be a separate product. Uh, yeah, these two are at a higher level. Uh, one of the best things that you can actually do is talk to your teams. Your teams will suggest services. The dev teams will, because they look at the code, right? They know how exactly these things work. So they will actually suggest that this needs to be a separate service, this needs to be a separate service. Very likely each of these services can be a product on their own. Uh, the key idea, like the care that you need to take over there though is don't just look at the service and take that as a product. Because very likely that service with few of its consumer, few of its like mobile applications, some BI system logic, all of this put together provides the service, right? And that, uh, now in this case service is not the software service, but the end user service. And that 
end service that you are trying to optimize is the real product. So now you have uh, this product manager saying that, hey, your goal is to optimize this. Obviously, each of these will have different metrics and so on and so forth. Uh, but yes, I think it's just about making the right call about where to draw the boundaries. They're always drawn in sand. Yeah. Yes. Hi. So, like, there are around 12 products which you are building, right? So, yes. 12 to 15. Depending so, on which month you ask me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, every product will have its own problems, operations will be different. So, yes. Like, how do you get the focus right? Like, in India, there are one one companies around each product. So, yes. And you guys are like one team. So, it's don't uh, you face problems like you are not able to go deep into problems of one? All the time, yes. All the time. I think that's true any company, right? Even if I look at Facebook and just getting taking that as an example, you just call it a social media, uh, like a social platform. The chat is a completely separate product. There is a huge team working on chat. The, the BI system over there has a different uh, product. Like the Facebook. post that you see is a separate product. So in our case, it's just that the abstractions are far more visible to the regular public, but that's true everywhere. I mean, it's not really special. At a very later stage, right? You are a very early stage startup, so yes, getting into so many verticals does not dilute your. So let me rephrase the question that you are ask, actually asking. Uh, as per classical wisdom or conventional wisdom, you should not uh, split focus into too many things. You should not try to catch too many birds. You will end up not having anyone, right? Uh, which is what we did. Uh, as per the standard uh, mobile application guidelines, you should not put too many products into the same thing and don't cross 10 or 12 MB. There is some magical threshold over there. Uh, don't cross that. We have kind of crossed that. Uh, so we have basically defied everything. And I'm not suggesting those rules were wrong. Okay, Those were like perfectly valid rules. Uh, because of the ecosystem, because of the product market fit that we were able to find, because of the cross-selling we were able to do on top of all these products existing together, uh, the very fact that the Indonesia as an ecosystem did not have a lot of alternatives to what we were offering, because of all of these things, we were able to do this, right? Doesn't mean it will work for everyone. Like, rather, a lot of people ask me that, are you guys coming to India? And I'm like, I don't think it will work over here, right? Uh, so it depends on the ecosystem that you are in. But coming back to the management bandwidth, uh, yes, it's painful, but I think it's worth it. I, I don't know how else I can answer it. Thank you, Akash. Uh, please Thanks. feel free to bug him once he's off stage. Uh,